Hello, everybody, and welcome back to Nine Lives, Season 2, Episode 6. Thank you for joining us today. I am joined by the wonderful Finley Hampton, uh, second time on the podcast. You will know him as uh, the 100 plus marathoner, my colleague, my friend. People loved you when you came on last time. I think uh, you definitely have a very gentle and wise approach to running and performance, which I think my audience definitely appreciate. I think in a world where running social media feels a little bit unapproachable and a bit intense at some times, it's nice to come across your page and see someone talking about, uh, you know, reaching for better in their life through running. So thank you for coming on again. Hopefully. Yeah. Am I the first repeat offender? You are. Yeah, it's awesome. rare that I have guests. Um, although I am going to, I do have a few more lined up. Um, so don't worry, people. It's not just going to be me yammering on every single week. But I wanted to have you back on because you are my coach. You are my running coach. And I think that that could be a really interesting conversation for people to hear um, from a coach's coach's no, a coach's coach perspective on how you've trained me or how you're training me for Paris. Yeah, we're not we're not there yet. There's we're no not there. <laughs> not there yet. We've got eight weeks. Yeah, and then even about. after that, there's yeah. going to be more and more. Yeah, yeah. Um, so obviously, this this whole marathon block that I'm in now um, is kind of I'm working towards getting fast or faster, um, and. We have lots of uh, questions from the uh, from the lovely community. We've got a, we're going to do a Q and A at the end of this podcast, um, but I wanted to maybe talk a little bit about what my plan is, why you program me this way, and what each run does uh, or is doing to make me faster um, from a coach's perspective. Obviously, I've been on like a massive journey. <laughs> We've all heard it before um, from being very overweight to now long distance running. And I kind of got to a place where, you know, I was running 5Ks, 10Ks very comfortably, half marathons very comfortably. Marathons, are they ever comfortable? <laughs> Don't think be. so. It can be. Um, but I'd always told myself that I would never be fast because that's just the idea that I had in my head where I was like, you know, okay, I'm just always going to be a slow-ish runner or whatever. I'm just going to do my little trail runs. But in the back of my mind, I'd always wanted, I'd always wanted to try to be fast. Or And fast, of course, is relative. My fast will not be someone else's fast, which will not be the next person's fast. So because it's a question that I get an awful lot, how do you get faster? <laughs> Do you want to talk us through a little bit about how you are programming me for yeah. Paris? Yeah, for sure. And I think that it's quite useful to use like a real life yeah. example in yeah. you, Cassia, going for the Paris full marathon, which I'll be pacing you. You will. Oh, yes. I forgot to say Finn is coming with me to Paris and will be pacing me uh, on this race, so, which, yeah. yeah. So come, cheer, and when we run by, throw things at us. Yeah, throw croissants. Soft things, okay, soft please. Things. Um, <laughs> And uh, yeah, how how to get fast? I mean, where do you start with that mm. question? Because you have some people that head into running and they have this kind of natural leaning into being a little bit quicker. And I'm literally speaking about myself here because I'm not a runner who's put in 15 years worth of graft to get where I am. I'm by no means the fastest, um, but I'm lucky and some people maybe like yourself you maybe feel like you have to work that little bit harder to get quicker times a little bit and sometimes you can't fight your dna your heritage yeah. the cards that you were dealt so whatever answer i give to this it's going to be so yeah nuanced yeah. And, and the advice that one person gives at any given time it might not be the advice for you so that's yeah. the first thing to cover off yeah but i think the useful thing thing with you know using you as an example is that a lot of people that follow you have very similar stories, stories. so yeah. there we go <laughs> but when it comes to your programming yeah it's not too dissimilar to to most people that i program it's like you don't have the full week to commit to seven sessions no maybe seven running sessions that might be you know a double session on a certain day and then three gym sessions no. you don't have that and, and i think that anyone listening to this there's probably like 0.01 percent that can do that yeah those are the athletes yeah. whose job it is to run. 
yeah you know and if that's the case and like i mean amazing place to be yeah. so when we're working with you know everyday people that have everyday jobs and, and are time restricted then we have to waver and, and train differently to an athlete yeah. because an athlete can get away with multiple speed sessions each week and it isn't such a hoo-ha compared to I think maybe I'm guilty of posting this but a lot of the stuff on social media is run slow to get faster run slow to get faster um it's it's difficult when you're not running so much you don't have the ability yes. to run so much that you can always run slow or always run fast and, and how do we find this perfect balance so the first thing about running faster is yes we need to make sure we have a relationship between the time that we spend running easy and the time that we spend running hard and if a training program has a good balance between that, then you're already in a, in a good place. Right. So if you take how much you're running each week, roughly on average, like four runs a week, is, is that fair to say? Three. Yeah, three it's to four? Three to four, yeah. So I think yours is going three, four, three, four, maybe. Yeah. Um, off the top of my head. But yeah. that doesn't mean that because we're not professional athletes, we can't do fast sessions. Mm -hmm. Every single week, there absolutely can be one session dedicated towards running hard. Mm -hmm. And you know what? Sometimes on your longer runs, I can be mean and say, <laughs> work towards race pace here or work towards sub race pace on the long run. Yeah. But some weeks, it's just solely one speed session and then the rest should be f relatively comfortable. Whether you stick to that or not, well, that's to be <laughs> decided. But um, yeah. you want to couple the the working hard with the working easy because they're working two different things and we're running slowly we're building our aerobic fitness which is our foundations which we can use as a springboard to then work on our tempo sessions our threshold sessions so we can sustain effort for longer mm -hmm. and uh, of course you know when we're working at you know lactate which you know is seen as a threshold how quickly can your body clear away the lactate that's produced of course that's getting us faster but we Look to that and don't tend to look at the really slow mileage, which yes. is actually the first thing that helps. Yeah. Um, so when it comes to your plan, you know, we're currently at, yeah, three to four runs a week. You're roughly doing one hard. It should be hard session yeah. each week, whether that's tempo, whether that's intervals, whether it's got elements of threshold. Mm. Um, and then every other week or so, if you look at that long run, mm. there are sections programmed out where I push you a little bit harder. You don't need to do that. Mm. But to get faster, the, the first answer that comes to my mind is really, it's that relationship between how often are you running hard and yep. how often are you running slow and easy? Yeah, because for me, what's been just delightful about this whole process is, first of all, having a coach, I think is just game changing in my mind because having someone else look from the outside and tell you what it is that you can be doing and have someone give you feedback is amazing. Because up until this point, I've kind of just been... I've been coaching myself and I've been kind of doing the guesswork of like, okay, I should try and push myself here. But having someone else tell you, by the way, you have a half marathon and eight kilometers of the ocean be race pace, you know, you're kind of like, okay, well, I've got this run today. I've got to do this today. And it does help a lot. But the, the most wonderful thing for me has been the proof of at the beginning of this, I didn't think I could get fast at all, ever. And now we're talking like two months later, I'm running like 450 paces yeah. comfortably for like two kilometers comfortably. But you know, those are paces that I, in my wildest dreams, never ever thought that I'd be able to ever hit for like even a half a kilometer, let alone two. And that has been so cool. Like I did quite a hard session last night on the treadmill. Um, because I do find it easier on the treadmill to go fast. I think because you don't have a choice. It's that or you die. You're, you're a <laughs> you sicko. Fall off. That's yeah. tough. It's, yeah, I don't know why. Um, but I, yeah, and I was just holding a 450 pace for two kilometers, feeling just like fine. And that's so crazy. And I think I'd really got in my head about, because I was a smoker and because of my knees and my body and all that, that I just, for some reason, I just thought, well, it's just never going to be for me. And I'd always looked at faster runners and maybe, and I can say this in hindsight with a hint of jealousy um, and being like, oh, I just, I'm never going to do that, you know. Um, but actually now being in a, a, a proper training block where you you are getting faster and doing the work and it is, it's quite hard work. It is hard work. It's proper hard. And, you know, I think I've just got so much more respect for people who get those times because Jesus. <laughs> it's like you've got to really your output's quite it's hard and during the runs you've got to dig to a place where because holding pace is different to holding distance 
distance after a while becomes like, oh, this is really nice. You know, I could just, I'll bring a picnic with me and I'll run 30 kilometers through the woods. That's like so, so nice. But holding those kind of paces for like an 8K tempo is a very different yeah. experience. Yeah. And, for sure. And I think you mentioned about, you felt like you were winging it before. And yeah. You know, let's be honest, the majority of us are. Yeah. And, and that's great. It got me really far. It can, surprisingly yeah. far. And I think what you're probably being opened up to now is what's a possible when yeah. you come into each session very well intentioned, just yes. like an athlete does. Okay, you can't give the hours to match what an athlete does, but when an athlete goes into each session, whether it's on the track, whether it's a long run outside, they're they're bringing their full focus into it and they're, and they're delivering the session. Yeah. From my experience of coaching people, um, I've never ever coached a single person that I've not gotten well with. So yeah, I, I thought I could just yeah. talk about anything. But, yeah. you know, if people were to be honest with themselves, a lot of the time they can go off schedule. You know, that's when the role of the coach comes in and maybe I've got to be a little bit firm. I've always said to you, like, yeah. do the session. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And But, you know, I think that that's a, the next step from winging it and just going out and, you know, doing that run in the woods with the picnic. That's amazing. I made a career out of that. Um, <laughs> but the next step to then start to, you know, run fast than you could ever imagine actually is in bringing your focus to this each session so yeah. if it's a conversational run for 6k and you think that's like beneath you or it's not exciting enough it's like do the conversational yeah. 6k and, and love it yeah and then when it comes to those hard sessions you have a little bit more oomph to give because yeah. you're well rested yeah because hopefully the coach has programmed you something that's very useful yeah and then <clears throat> something that I hadn't done before or at least I think because my whole running journey has been intuitive up until this point. So that's probably what the word I was looking for was intuitive. As mm -hmm. in when I fancied it, I've gone for a run <clears throat> and I've let my body decide the distance. And then last year ran the London Marathon and was traumatized by that because I was so unprepared. Because the first marathon I ran was in the woods on my own, which is very different to the to the London Marathon different experience yeah, um you did incredible you, you ran that marathon faster than i ran like my first one really yeah oh okay well um but i remember just being like okay if i want to do a marathon again i want it to be proper as in i want to give this the mm. grace that it deserves and you know actually having those runs programmed for you and then having like a deload week for example I just took deloads because it was like, I was like, oh, I'm tired. I'm going to skip my run. But what is the purpose of a, of a deload when you're looking at it in a, in a race prep? Yeah. It, it, again, it can change on whoever you're working with, but essentially it allows, it's a period of time. Let's take seven days. It could be seven days and you have it every six weeks, every five weeks, it could nice. be every eight weeks, but it depends on the individual. But essentially it's a period where obviously you, you still run mm -hmm. and you still do sessions. Potentially you drop a session and then each of the other sessions are a little bit lighter in volume, mm -hmm. maybe 30, 40% lighter than usual. And what this, the science behind it is it allows your body to adapt to the, the changes it's made during the previous six week block of training. You know, that, that period where things can just settle down um, and the idea is that instead of running and keep pushing on week on week on week, that's tiring, it's draining, it's not fun, and it can be exhausting. So uh, if you put a deload week in there, you can let your body rest and yeah. heal. Recover. Yeah, adapt to, to the changes. Yeah. And and again, I think I spoke about this on the last podcast, but people, this, this all sounds very physical, which is great, but in the moment of the deload week, you can just like do other things and maybe you have a bit more time to do something else. And having that nonchalant behavior yeah. is actually yeah. really important it as is. well. Like um, I always said when I was going into my ultra marathon, because that distance really scared me, 15K. But the only thing that got me through it and got me through that whole like prepping for it, which I was totally winging, by the way, um, I was just out in France running randomly, but it worked. It was fine for that. Um, but I just unbig dealified it. This is what I always say. Like yeah. you have to sometimes you have to be like, it is a big deal, but it's also not like I am here to have fun. This is meant to be a hobby that is fun and I'm meant to be enjoying it. <laughs> Absolutely. I, I have I have clients or I've had clients in the past that it seems like there's so much riding on every session. And mm. if you do it or you don't, it's the end of the world. And I would just say you do or you don't. Full yeah. stop. There's nothing at the yeah. end of that. And and you know, a, a training block 
whether it's lasting for eight weeks or whether it's 20 weeks long, you know, one singular run isn't going to make or break you. And, and having that kind of jovial, lighthearted nature is, is just paramount. And I'm, I'm fortunate because I can, I mean, I sit here and I know what it's like to cover far distances and, and fast. So it, it's kind of easy for me to say, but, but genuinely just look at whoever you, your idols are and look how they are. Usually it's, it's just kind of peaceful and, yeah. and lean into that a bit more. Yeah, I definitely notice when I'm having like hard weeks at work or feeling a little stressed in other, you know, aspects of my life. Um, I put a lot more pressure on myself to perform well in running <laughs> because then I'm like, well, at least I've got that. Like, and if that then doesn't feel good, then I'm like a mess. So I think just, yeah, letting it be sort of like a calm practice where you are just a little bit more like chilled out with yourself. Yeah. tends to get better results definitely and that's where all the excitement is it's mm. in it's actually the the lack of control and and the ability to give up what you think you have control of like mm. you know in in science we're we're looking more and more into what we're made up of and, and we can zoom into cells at a magnification that's never been done before and the more they go in they're finding just space yeah and what's that made up of more space and and we're these beings surrounded by all this matter that's just space which is made up of nothing yet we're trying to say this run will define me or <laughs> if I can do this run it's gonna be great and yeah it doesn't make sense to me yeah so um, to caveat off that point which is a very interesting point um I spoke in a previous episode with Joe my fiance uh all about spiritualism and how running is a very spiritual pra practice for me do you find, are you a spiritual person? And do you find that running is a spiritual practice for you? Do you find that it's something that kind of, that resonates with you in any way? Yeah, definitely. I, I mean, when I was like 15, 16, I was really big into, I believe they're called the Four Horsemen. And it's oh, yeah. made up of people like uh, Richard Dawkins, uh, Christopher Hitchens. Yeah. Um, and I was just like a total atheist and I didn't have an ounce of spirituality. I, I probably would have laughed anyone out of the room because I probably wasn't that nice. And I just, you know, I, I was young and probably not made up of great informed choices, but f now I have absolutely like, no, I don't even need to think yeah. Yeah, for me running is super spiritual. Yeah. And, and I kind of used to only ever see life as physical. Hence why I was like, it's either no or yes. And for me, I was on that side of no, there is no spirituality, there is no God or higher power. And um, whilst I don't think that there is necessarily a higher power, I do think that, you know, we're all spiritual beings and we are having this spiritual experience, whether we like it or not. Yeah. Um, and, and running is, uh, I mean, what a chance to, in this, you know, fast paced world to just get out there and uh, unless I'm out there slogging, making content, it's not quite the same, but um, if I'm just on yeah. my own in the woods. Yeah. How do you, how often do you get that time to yourself? Yeah. Not a lot. Not a lot anymore. But uh, yeah, I think for me, running is all about self-discovery um, and expansion of self as well. Like just sort of realizing just how far you can push yourself and things that you learn about yourself along the way. And I think with the explosion of running becoming so popular since lockdown, I would say, mm. I think a lot of people are realizing that it's very much about... Um, looking inward instead of the external and Massive. discovering that about themselves. And I think th it's like record breaking amounts of people are now entering half marathons and marathons. And I think we might have something to do with that, but um, I think it's just such a cool time and such a, an amazing way that maybe people don't even realize what they're doing is a spiritual practice, but through, you know, constant pressure on themselves to improve, they're kind of just you know changing their reality and that is a spiritual practice in itself and it's so wicked to see and I think what is lovely is and I've had a few clients come to me who just want to do like a bit of body recomp some lifting and then I always <laughs> end up I'm like have you heard of a marathon <laughs> have you heard of a half marathon and they're like no 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 don't I want to get into this long distance running thing like no and I'm like all right fine so I'm just like, well, okay, we'll try, we'll start with cardio, see if you want to maybe like do one run a week, like on the treadmill. And then they end up just being like, that was actually really nice. That made me feel really good. And then I always find when people start running outside, something changes. And then they start to realize that oh, I can connect with nature while I'm doing this. I can connect with myself while I'm doing this. Like, I know that when I get to the end of the run, I'll have a sense of fulfillment that like feels absolutely incredible. And then when you start, 
going through the distances and being like first five, 10, 15, half, full. It's just like, it's magical. <laughs> it's magical. And um, I'm yet to find a metaphor in anything else that I think works so well as running for life. Yeah. Just, you know? just moving through space time a little bit quicker than you usually <laughs> would. The, you know, if it was medicine and you could bottle it up, it would be the, the best thing yeah. for, any, for any patient. And, yeah. Um, yeah, I mean, in terms of, of getting outside and, and running by yourself, I think that we we just don't turn inwards enough a right. lot of the time. Yeah. Like I, I always mention, we're in this physical world, in this mm. physical world, and and I do think we're slowly waking up to the fact that nothing outside of us, nothing out there can affect anything on the in. You know, when when we're nothing on the outside, we can be anything on the inside. Mm. Um, and you've got to shed all these layers. It's like an onion peeling it back, and you kind of think that this is me. No, it's not. Sh shed that back. This is me. No, it's not. Shed that back. And eventually you you, you had that kind of realization when you're deep into a run on your own. You're like, everything I thought was true has yeah. no truth behind it. Literally. Yeah. I I think um, it's like the great untangler for me, the great untangler of thoughts. Like I can be having a really fraught or anxious morning, anxious day, whatever. And, and I know, and it's so funny because every time I forget and I'll put my run off, put my run off, put my run off. Cause I'm just like, Oh no, let me just deal with these emails first. Let me just do this. But I know that it should always come before because as soon as I'm out there in that place, giving myself that space, they just seem to untangle naturally. They just fall and like fall away the ones that don't matter. And then I'm able to problem solve. And it's just that forward motion. It's just, it's completely nuts. That it is. That is that it, we and it's just moving slightly faster yeah i know and i i think i walked today from paddington station to to like charing cross area maybe it was like a two and a half mile yeah walk and uh on on the way here i was like back in the day if you if you rewind you know six seven years i'm just getting a tube there yeah but oh, i just love it yes yeah. Same. It's not a run, but yeah. you're still moving through. I walk everywhere now. Like yeah. as many times as I can, I'll choose to walk. Um, I just, yeah, it's so meditative. Um, it's, yeah, I, I hope that everyone is able to give themselves the gift of that. And it doesn't have to be running. It can just be walking if we're talking about like movement therapy. You yeah, know, yeah, definitely. And I think this is definitely something that I've mentioned a, a bunch, whether it's in conversations or in conversations like this. And actually the, I think the secret almost to life is, however you feel out on the run. This is this took me a long time to to discover and, and, and hopefully implement. And it's actually that every second of your day can be like the run mm -hmm. and that feeling of being meditative. It's, you don't need, it doesn't need to like a meditation retreat in order to be in the moment. And actually you, you can have it no matter what's going on in your life, whether mm -hmm. it's good or bad, you know, but we're always gonna have challenges. I'm never, say, I'm never gonna sit here and say that life's gonna be easy, but you can have that feeling no matter what you're doing because at the end of the day if you break things down enough all we're doing is a movement or an action to reach a goal yeah. you know whether that is pulling this microphone close to my face it's the same as going for a run i'm just mm. doing something to get something out of it and mm. that that's something that i i'm still working towards but mm. i think that's a, a real exciting adventure definitely do you think with running because so many people are like how are you not bored of this yet like you talk about this like pretty much every week and you've got friends who do it and like there's this whole thing do you think there's an aspect of drinking the kool-aid when it comes to like the running community <laughs> drinking the Kool -Aid. <laughs> because i was having this conversation with uh, the podcast producer rihanna who is also running paris who you are also coaching um and she's just fully drank the Kool-Aid, you know, we're just like sending each other our splits. We're talking about running shoes. Like once you get into that, it's just like this. It's not a cult, but it's definitely <laughs> there's definitely aspects of it that I just think from the outside looking in, I should say. Or when I was on the outside looking in at the running community, I was like, what, what's going on here? This is very strange. There's all these clubs and they're all talking about all these different things and da 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 da. But once you're in it and you realize just how magical it is, it becomes just second nature to become quite, I think, obsessed, but very in it. But I think what's the most important part is that running is and remains accessible for everyone and that there isn't this kind of like, you know, cult vibe when it comes to the running community, especially in London. Um, and I think that's why people really like your content and your conversations, because they just feel very 
non-threatening, <laughs> like you say, like easy. Yeah, I, I just hope that, you know, I'd like to say that I talk about things with no like hidden agenda. Yeah. You know, I, I don't want anything out of it yeah. other than just to to speak what I think is, is true. And that isn't always the case. I'm sure I, mm -hmm. I talk a lot of rubbish, but yeah, I, I think especially with running, it feels very much like just these energies of, excitement coming together and I, I from my experience in 20 2019 I I started I started a few running clubs but I started this one that's in my mind and, and one's called Monday Night Running very that's inventive name cool <laughs> and I did it when I was living in Oxford and it was basically for like university students to come down to I didn't have any kind of like legal systems in place so if someone fell I would have been screwed it wasn't official it was just like me and yeah. then this Monday Night Running and and people came and, and sometimes it was two people and sometimes it was like 25. And I remember at the time thinking, this is just so weird because this isn't that sexy. It's dark. Yeah. It was like the autumn, winter time. Yeah, these people are turning out like uni students get a bad rep. But when we're here, like we're so engaged with one another. And that, that was like a, a moment along the way of my path where I thought there's just something in this here. And mm. I, I feel like as the months and years have gone by, everything you just mentioned about you know, you and Rihanna drinking the Kool-Aid. Mm. It's just like, that is just snowballing. Yeah. And now we have this like, just massive movement. Yeah. And it, it, it doesn't surprise me because what is it at the core? It's just people excited to be with each other, doing something fun. And be alive, I think, yeah. you know? I think fitness, especially online fitness, became very insular and separate and a little bit competitive. Not that running isn't, running doesn't feel competitive to me. I don't know why. But um, I think with running it's given people the chance to sort of be outside and do something just to do it just to discover something instead of trying to change themselves or anything like that it's a it's a really really beautiful thing to witness and I think if we break it down to kind of like two aspects of it obviously there's the physical which is the like practical running advice and what the program is that I'm on now for Paris and all of that good stuff but a huge part of it is uh mindset and a success mindset and cultivating a success mindset um there's a lot of questions that I usually get around self-sabotage embarrassment self-belief um kind of getting out of your own way when it comes to believing that you can do these things have you ever struggled with embarrassment or self-sabotage or anything like that because obviously sometimes we just look at Finn and you're just so happy just running <laughs> along the street at all times but are these things that have ever crossed your mind or have you always been quite you know in the flow no no I've I've, I've definitely suffered from embarrassment I feel like uh, this year I know oh not this year in 2023 I got pooed on by a bird three times over separate occasions oh, I it, wasn't, the same it, one it wasn't the same it wasn't the same <laughs> bird just coming back but you know I got pooed on twi uh, three times in a year which uh, has that ever happened to anyone else no it's embarrassing because it was like all both times like all over me oh god <laughs> um but uh anyway bef before I kind of started this whole running adventure yeah I, I was prone to all of that and I, I still am you know I, I think that because I have this, whether it's my girlfriend or my friends, they definitely look to me as if I'm this, you know, enlightened yogi. <laughs> I'm absolutely not. You know, if I was to give a visual of it, it's that I have a basement just like everyone else. And if you were to shine a light in it, you see some rubbish in the corner and, and you clear it out. But you go back with a more bright light mm. and there's more. and You miss some. Mm. And actually, there's always going to be some rubbish you got to clear out. And I, I still feel like that's how I live life. And the rubbish takes shape in many different forms, you know, whether it is self-sabotage, whether it is embarrassment. And I, I have all of that. But I, I think that if there's one thing that I'm, I'm super grateful for is that I think my ability to respond to it, it isn't different to anyone else's. But I just trust it a lot more. And I know that whatever situation I've been presented with, I just there's never been a time that I wasn't able to respond to it. Um whether it came out in an embarrassing way, um, you know, I can't help that. And I'm just okay with that. And I think a lot of the time it's people's relationship with their ability to respond and not knowing it and not trusting it is where a lot of the issues are caused. And um, running for sure has helped me mellow and hopefully become a little bit more wise. But mm. there's never, I mean, the day when it comes that I can say that I'm rid of all embarrassment. I mean, it'll be an interesting day, but I don't see it Whoever coming is. anytime soon. No, I mean, like <clears throat> I said, 
in a previous episode just talking about how uh to be cringe is, is to be free to yeah. be cringe is to live like i'm one of the cringiest people you'll ever meet i'm so in touch with my feelings and i think it's the best thing ever yeah. i'm constantly embarrassing people myself and i love it <laughs> but, but this is i mean this is such a unusual situation to be in because obviously you have a podcast now and you wouldn't have had one you know let alone two years ago five years ago you know yeah. and um to put yourself out there is a really tough thing to do. So I was actually speaking to someone the other day about this and, and how I went really, really out of my way to try and make myself less cringe, especially with running. Um, you talk about these moments of like self-sabotage and embarrassment. I remember I used to just drink so much beer, marathon to marathon. So I'd go run a marathon and then drink loads of beer with the boys and then go run a marathon the next day, drink loads of beer. Because that was my way of being like, I haven't changed. I'm not cringe. I know you see this guy that, that runs marathons every day and and posts about it and talks online to like two followers and it might seem cringy, but hey, I'm, I'm drinking beer. And I went so far into trying to cover that up. I, I would never do that now. Yeah. So even when I talk about all these stories and it might still come across like I'm really calm now, that was not how it was in the moment. That's so fascinating mm. that you felt the need to like still don't know if it's people pleasing but yeah massive because it does feel quite cringy in a way sometimes because putting yourself out there is the most terrifying thing in the world for any human being because what we fear most is rejection and red and ridicule and if you're doing something and putting yourself out there you will face rejection and ridicule every day i think social media is such a good you know way of seeing that like it's just every day you just get used to it but you cannot make change in yourself others or the world without putting yourself out there so embrace the cringe embrace the embarrassment do it with a red face do it with tears streaming down your face but just bloody do it get out there and the people pleasing stuff if it is people pleasing whatever it is i i weirdly when i started running and properly distance run long distance running um was still going to the pub a lot with my friends because i you know i still wanted to be like no wait guys i'm still cool no i know this running thing is so weird what a weird <laughs> such a weird hobby but inside i'm like i really love this it's the only thing making me feel like a human it makes me feel like i can do anything oh but it's fine i'll come to the pub like yeah definitely let's yeah. split a bottle of wine like you know not of course you can you can drink and you can run you do both <laughs> most of my friends and family do both whatever um but it's just really interesting you felt the need to kind of extinguish that light in front of people yeah and, and this is the, the the same guy that a couple of years prior to that i lived with the quote you're playing small does not serve the world there is nothing enlightened about shrinking so that other people won't feel insecure around you i had that on my bedroom wall wow but i wasn't living it and that's the thing where i i'm so aware whenever you know i jump in a conversation like this it doesn't have to be filmed and mic'd up but just in in normal conversations in life that i, I am not the finished article at all and what, a lot of what I say comes from this viewpoint of uh, I've got it easy and I know all the answers and I, I don't, but I think I've probably made a lot of mistakes and that's the thing that I want to share because yeah. um, I, I, f I do genuinely feel in a, a really good place now and it's not come from thin air, basically. Yeah, mistakes are, mistakes are my, I mean, they're the best thing ever, I think, because that's how we learn and grow, you know? If you don't make mistakes, you, you won't learn. And I think people are so terrified of making mistakes or being bad at things that they never start. Um, and I've started so many things over the last year that I've been awful at, uh, really bad. And I'm still really bad at them, but I'm still doing them because I think they're fun. Um, like podcasting, for example, my first episode, I listened to it the other day. <laughs> I was like, ooh, I've come a long way since then. I wasn't very good. But now I think I'm decent. And then maybe in the future I'll be excellent. But it just goes to show you've just got to keep trying, even if it scares yeah. you. Not that's, just with running, with anything. That's really cool. I, you know, like, imagine if you're constantly looking over your shoulder at the mistakes you're going to make mm -hmm. and then trying to work towards a goal. Mm -hmm. I mean, like, as, as a coach, that is like 101 disaster yeah. <laughs> waiting to happen. You know, you, yeah. you want to be able to live life and and just it's not even a case of looking forward. It's just engaging deeply in what you're doing now. And, and I think when you do that, you just don't live a consequence. Mm -hmm. So you're able to go do the podcast, maybe be pretty shoddy. I don't think you were, by the way, but yeah. And, and there is no, yes, it was great. No, it was awful. It was 
it was it just what is. it was. Yes, exactly. Just it. let it be. Yeah. Like that's, I think people are searching for these great highs and lows, you know, and it's either fantastic or it's either a disaster. Sometimes existing in the kind of mundane is like really lovely because that's just where life is. Just like kind of it's okay sometimes, you know. You're in it. Yeah. Um, but then, okay, so if you could give people advice on how to overcome embarrassment, let's say it's someone who, because this is a real thing is people are embarrassed to start running outside. Um, and I mean, I was mortified to try running the first time because <laughs> how do you run? You know, it's like, you just like go out, you open the front door and you're like, and I'll just move a little bit faster now, you know? Um, and I was really embarrassed, especially to be seen in public, which is a, that's a whole other issue of work through in therapy. But what advice would you give to someone who is wanting to do the unbelievable, start their running journey, but they just feel too embarrassed to try? Yeah, I hear them first and foremost, because this is like a question that I've had loads mm. from, you know, 2018 onwards and it shows no signs of stopping so first and foremost anyone that does feel like that I mean, you should feel totally heard and and my god you're not alone because for every time you are sat there are a lot of other people in the same situation too which hopefully by default just gives you some sense of ah, belonging yeah for yeah. sure you know you're not this interesting odd one out you're, no. you're very much part of this human experience and and things don't come easy to some people and and other things do and I think that if, if you want practical advice it's you can try and get all the good gear to perhaps make you feel better about it but that still isn't solving the problem it's that relationship you know going on and that internal experience and and I've already mentioned it but there's nothing outside that's going to help you and, and mm -hmm. actually if you know that and you start to think about that that can be the thing that kickstarts you onto the journey because there isn't a world where there isn't a cat cooler, for example, yeah. you know, like yeah. th there's always going to be yeah. pieces of shit in the world. <laughs> and, uh, don't uh, know, every day. and, and, and there's also never going to be the, the perfect line to run on, um, mm. where there's no people around. And mm. so what do you do with that? Start to turn inwards. And I think that you can always have people saying, oh, just, <laughs> just get outside. And I know it's not as simple as that. Um, but if you choose to run around places that you really like and you really enjoy being around, that's, that's a start. And yeah, I, yeah you're, you're not alone is probably the best thing. Yeah, I think everyone's embarrassed. You know, most people I know who start were mortified or people I've worked with were mortified to start and now enter races. I mean, geez, the thought of being seen in public running, let alone now entering world major marathons and having people and Im inviting people and being like come watch me do this thing um is crazy but I would say as well there's a little bit of fake it till you make it um or someone said that that wasn't a good thing to say because faking it isn't what you're doing you're like embodying it until you become it is Ooh. a better way of saying it you know um so for me I just had to quite literally tell myself that I was an, Olymp an Olympic runner <laughs> when I really wasn't, but I just used to kind of cosplay as one. And I'd be like, today we're an Olympic runner and we're gonna go and do a really fast 5K, took me an hour. Um, and I think there's something to be said for that, but also knowing that everyone is in their own little human experience, bumbling along wherever you run. I used to run on the Thames path. I used to just imagine everyone was in their own little worlds with their own little problems, trying to do their own little thing. And the last thing they cared about was a young woman running on the Thames path. They're not going to perceive that. They're just going to be in their own world. And I think also seeing the world through the lens of like, if you can believe the best in people, I would look at new runners now and always look at new runners with like, go on, dude. It's the best feeling to see people out there trying. And I would hope that most of the human population are nice enough to also think that too. Yeah. and be supportive so maybe going into it with a bit of uh positivity blind positivity yeah i, I love this idea that we're, we're just all trying our best yeah what i mean i'm not saying that there is a best personally i don't think there is mm. this best version of yourself <laughs> um and that's what makes life so exciting but i i just love it you know whether it's someone that's not treated you nicely or whatever your situation that you find yourself in is that whatever we're doing we're, we're, we are just trying our best and we yeah. and you can't go back unfortunately in the past and go change things you're, you're just living now and and that's why you might look back at some you know some things you've done in your life and go oh I've done that differently it's like yeah great but you can't yeah 
you were doing the best of what you had. And yeah. if you went back and did it again, you'd do the same thing. So every moment that we're living in, I love that idea that we're just doing our best. And, and who's to say that, you know, your journey is going to remain the same. You look at yours, you would still be stuck on the Thames path. Mm -hmm. I mean, I love the Thames path, mm -hmm. but, you know, still maybe bashing out the, the one hour 5Ks, but you are open. Mm -hmm. You're open to, to see what happened, uh, to see what would happen. And mm -hmm. look where that took you. And we only grow in discomfort. That's the only way. So being uncomfortable, being embarrassed and doing it anyway is so brave, but you will reap the rewards of that afterwards. You know, you will see what you're made of really, truly. And then with that self-belief, you can start building upon that. And who knows, you could be running Paris Marathon. I'm trying to sub four hour Paris Marathon, which is what we're aiming towards. My last marathon was four hours 12, I believe. It won't be trying for sub four. It will just, it will be well under sub four. Do you it's, think it's, so? It's, uh, I fit. I'm, I'm your terrified. coach. I'm your coach. I, I know it will. I'm, yeah. How am I doing? Give me a little, you know, performance. Well, I think you'll come well <laughs> under sub four. That's okay. all I'll say. Okay. Because I, uh, I am scared. I'm not going to lie. Because I, um, yeah, the last time I did like a proper, proper race was London and I just really did not like that experience. But I think that's because I was pushed to the front. <laughs> yeah. Funny story, but uh, I started the London Marathon, my first ever official race at the front of the men's elite uh, <laughs> wave. Thanks to a lovely colleague of ours who, anyway, that's another story. But I think in Paris, I'll be in my correct wave. Yes, I'll be properly fueled, rested, full of croissants and ready to go i've got my playlist that's really what is the most important part and then you'll be running next to me i mean to bring it back to the, <laughs> the start as well yeah you have a pace of me but yeah. um you said about your training program actually a lot of your sessions and, and a lot of the the percentage of the mileage that you run a lot of it's well under race pace so this is something that you can do as a as a run coach to certain um clients it depends you know sometimes people don't respond well to that but mm. a lot of the miles that you do actually are quite heavily under race pace that should give you even more confidence confidence because you're, you're working with it with a buffer and that's something right. that i do for people it's so variable based on the person you're working with but you you when you wanted to be coached by me you said that you wanted nick, nick bear sessions <laughs> if you don't know nick bear he's a He's a fitness influencer. He's one of the OGs and I discovered him. Uh, he ran the, I think it was like the California Mar Marathon or something. Anyway, he, his team made this beautiful video of him running this marathon. And I just, I loved those bouncing pecs and I just wanted some of those like really hard runs. And he's incredibly, you know, he's well-spoken. He's quite poetic about running. He's just a very, yeah. you know, I don't know anything about him, but he's... Explanatory dude, yeah. You know. And um, if you look at his sessions... They are nuts. yeah. Right. Don't get me wrong, though. He he couples it with you know he still has his very conversational sessions, right? And and he does run high, very high mileage. Yeah, he does each week. However, a lot of his, whether it's you know his faster stuff, it is still tempo. But he does a lot of threshold, which comes a little bit mm -hmm. fast in tempo. So you've been working to that to some degree. Cool. Because um, he he yeah. so he went from a four hour twenty marathon to a two, he just ran two hours thirty eight if I'm not wrong or two hours forty something. It's two. I want to say two forty something. Two yeah. Which for a ridiculous. man of his you know he's a, he's so this guy's a big he's quite he's heavier he's a tank. As in, he's a tank he's jacked, um, which was very very inspiring for me because you know I I'm someone who holds weight and loose skin and stuff and I was like if that man can propel himself <laughs> through a marathon in sub three hours. I think I could do sub four. He's also the perfect example of, I mean, don't get me wrong. He's, he's worked to get to where he's got to, but mm. he trains like a, an athlete. Oh, it, his consistency is incredible. So and could, that's something I find. Could it. you mirror that? No, you probably, you mirror no. it. If instead of miles, you do it in Ks. That's yeah. probably a fair reflection. Yeah. I, I think this is something that I have learned about myself is that I, I burn out really easily. And I think this is something to do with um, just living with a mood disorder and struggling with mental health stuff. And I don't I don't actually see this discussed very much like high mileage for me, even though I have this romantic idea that I could be Nick Bear and that I want to do these crazy 20 milers every single day or, you know, I'm obviously not 20 miles every day. But, you know, I, I noticed that when I'm really my output is that high, I start to exhaust myself and I start to feel bad mentally and then I start to burn out at work. And it seems to be the cycle where my true I think optimal feeling happy when I'm not preparing for a race is three seven miles a week 
that's that for me just feels so nice and that's all I need genuinely and I think I'm just learning that not not everyone can have that kind of output and I will openly admit that I don't I can't have that kind of output and it's not a nutrition thing it's not a sleep thing you know I'm really good in all those aspects I just think maybe some people just can't and that doesn't mean I can't get fast it doesn't mean I'm not a runner it just means that I have other parts of my life especially my mental health that really need to be nurtured and finding the balance for me has admitted been admitting that I can't do that that kind of high mileage you know yeah but it's like you take a snapshot into anyone's life and be like oh my god they've got it all yeah and what you're getting is is one glimpse of yeah. your very different reality and we've got to be careful with what we we lean into and what we we learn from because mm. just because Nick Bear does something one way it's <laughs> like you're not Nick Bear I spoke about this the other day but you know it's that classic Hollywood movies mm. the the film I ends it's a lovely lovely end and then the, the credits roll but you don't see what happens when they wake up the next day yeah but we're in this life as a, living this human experience where and until we don't we are constantly living that next day and yeah be careful what you lead into because you can only work with what you've got yeah and by the way 21 miles a week you can do some really good work with that <laughs> I, I think so too I really I do I think that the less I it's a fine balance between pushing yourself just enough but not pushing yourself too much that you burn out um and this was a. Uh, another another sort of topic that I wanted to speak with you about um and it seems to be quite a general question I get a lot um but it would be avoiding injury and burnout and sort of all, all of that that area um because this is something that I've done and I have I've never been injured running and I think this is because probably a bit of luck um a lot of strength training really like eating properly and uh not doing crazy output I would say throughout consistently I've never even in my ultra blocks I think the longest run I did was like 10 or 12 miles or something like leading up to that and that seems to suit me just fine and I notice that the more mileage I have the more I start to feel a bit creaky the more I get cranky the less I perform at work the more I don't want to run then I don't want to race yeah. so it's finding that kind of balance while not comparing yourself to other runners too right because if I looked at like I don't know um, anyone who I follow who is like a runner online and I saw their output for a marathon, it would be, uh, mine would be half. But that's fine because I'm not burning out and I'm not getting injured. So finding that balance, that's the tricky part, right? If, if you're following a plan where every week there's a super high volume long run, it might not be the plan for you. Um, and I, I still get clients now. It's like they don't trust me. Yeah. Even after all these months or years, it's, uh, hi Finn, just checking that this is did you correct. need to put 12k in for this long run you know I'm seven weeks out from marathon I'm like yeah I did I did mean that because I've also given you a bunch of runs in the week and if you add that total up that's a big volume this mm -hmm. week and we put so much emphasis on the long run and we never ever big up the little guys yeah the recovery runs the the tempo sessions or the hill repeats or the conversational pace runs people almost like just they, they think that they're tick boxes but mm. the long run holds all the the value mm. it's not how it works every single session like i mentioned at the start you bring your attention to it and you f your full focus you will have better gains uh over a longer period of time than if we're like okay can i do more each week can i do more of that long run mm. do 20k 22k 22k 24k um uh, in terms of like injury and how to stay injury free uh, again this is something that I don't think I have the answer to, and that's a controversial answer, but because everyone is so different and I, I only know my experience and yes, I like to think that I can program and I can coach well, but ultimately it's you that leads you to where you go. And I never really want to interfere with that. I think actually good coaches do the best to interfere the least and, and coaches that try and get two hands on. It, it's not the way that I, I, I go about it. So when it comes to injury, it's usually either the universe or something giving you a message. Right. And can we tune into this? And this is why I always think that going inwards is the best thing. And it's like, if I could, as a coach, be saying, okay, so you've got this lateral knee pain. It looks like it could be runner's knee. Um, go inwards. <laughs> It'd be great. I'd love to do that. Obviously, I don't do that. Yeah. But there's usually something that's not quite right in your life. 
and a lot of the time it isn't just the running because if we're going to be honest the running makes up half a percent or one percent of your your day if you're running an hour a day so it's definitely more towards half half a percent of the day so is it going to be the running or is it going to be the fact that you're not happy at work or that your partner was rude to you and you didn't disclose that and now it's awkward or is it that you're not sleeping well you're not fueling properly i would look towards those before okay. blaming it on the running um there are practical steps that we can do. I can list off loads of, you know, single leg exercises and I'm not going to do that. But of course we can strengthen. Of course we can build sustainable but productive training blocks. All this stuff. I would be looking, especially as I spent time working in pain management, with people with chronic lateral knee pain, with shin splints, with Achilles tendinop uh, tendinopathy, I would be looking at your life as a whole. And uh I know that, that maybe isn't what people want to hear, but it's from from my experience is is the only way that's true. And and when I've dealt with pain, <laughs> as quick as it's come on, as quick as it's gone, when I've when I've kind of addressed a few areas of my life, and it's unbelievable. My, my girlfriend Sophie, when she gets stressed, she gets like pain in her lat, and she goes, "Oh, I've injured my lat," and I'm like, "You haven't injured your You're lat. Stressed. You 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 know this. It's your yeah. little marker." And uh, next day, how is it? That's oh, fine. And I think that's mind blowing. And if we could tune into that a little bit more. Very interesting. Yeah. Very interesting. Because the main question uh, from our lovely audience has been preventing injuries, knee pain from running so much. I deal with that a lot. It, I mean, it's again, and it's the same question again. But, um, and I think actually even the last episode we spoke about knees. Um, yeah, we did. So like for context of my knees, I have, um, what are they called? Band bandy knees or... Um, bowed knees mm -hmm. um yeah. from being obese the weight on my knees for so long bent my legs so that they're now valgus um, is it valgus i think so valgus or varus something One like that two. but my my shins basically go like this mm -hmm. um because obviously you shouldn't or i mean carrying that amount of weight on my knees for so long internal rotation of the hips yes so, yeah um which should make my knees weaker and does mean that i probably wouldn't be as good with running right and i i've never experienced knee pain which is very strange. Um, and I think having weak knees or whatever that is, it, running, I mean, I think you had a really interesting point last episode about running actually not being bad for your knees. That is kind of a myth. Um, I think in lower mileage as well, especially it can strengthen the knees and the ligaments and everything. Yeah. Um, so practical advice, strength train obviously fuel properly and rest and, I, and and it's so boring but that kind of is what it is and stress management like you say like I mean I have like a very small hip flexor thing that sometimes flares up when I'm stressed go figure if, if people were really honest with themselves I, I'm sure we've all experienced that and it's this resistance to go inwards and and not try and go to the coach necessary for an answer. I mean, that sounds mental. I'm, I'm a coach saying that, but but the uh, it's my experience, especially with a lot of the running challenges that I've done, um, whether it was running marathons back to back for three weeks or running 110 miles, there's always going to be that challenge, but no one has ever given me the answer mm. still. I, you know, I've had really great mentors and, and coaches along the way. It's, you know, I've learned so much, but no one's given me the answer to anything. And that isn't a bad thing. And I actually think that's really important, especially, I mean, this is completely off topic, but setting parameters and boundaries with your coach as well is, is huge. It's, it's actually, I think it's admirable when a coach says, I actually can't help with that. Oh, yeah. That's the I, that's one of the huge things about coaching is knowing when I, yeah. I, I can't help you with that or you need to see a therapist, you need yeah. a life coach, you need, you know, whatever it is, just outsource, outsource, outsource as much as you can or an injury specialist, you know. For sure. Because um, we can, there are so many exercises. Mm. There's so many exercises you can do. You just you literally just said the p most important things, the rest, the strengthening, yeah. eating well. And then off, on top of that having a program that really allows you to yeah. flourish and, and build and enjoy your life enjoy well. your life and, and grow grow mileage accordingly to the level that you're at which mm -hmm. hopefully most of the time is very chilled mm -hmm. and it only rises by x amount maybe 10 percent max each week yeah um but these are just these are just words yeah i know it's that's the difficult thing it's I always find that like the frustrating part of giving advice is that there's only so much that you can tell people before they have to look inside and know themselves and learn themselves because there's a, such a fine balance between 
rest recovery, but also pushing yourself to do a session you don't want to do. But when do you know that that's going to burn you out? But when do you know? No, no, no. Let the noise kind of dull down for yourself. Take a moment to be still with yourself and, and really try and build that relationship of, of trust and be, you know, go inwards, like you say, and, and try and ask yourself, you know, what is it that I need? Am I doing too much? Is the thought of skipping a run scaring me? Is that a negative thought? It shouldn't scare you. You know, if you have to skip a run, it should just be like, I've skipped a run. Yeah. Anyway, yeah. let's go to bed, you know. So yeah. looking at all of those things and thinking, is this like a health, am I having a healthy relationship with myself and running? And, and yeah. you know, is that why I'm getting injured? Uh, uh, just quickly, a story I've got, an eye-opening moment I had was, one of my challenges was 18 marathons in 18 days. Ooh. Wow. <laughs> I, I got to my 19th one. I don't know if any people know this. I ran my 19th marathon. <clears throat> Excuse me. And uh, I really didn't want to do it. So I got halfway through and I, I had this massive realization. Oh, what am I doing this for? Like, I, I didn't feel like I was gaining anything new. There wasn't any, you know, expansive living to be found. Like, I was just doing what I did the day before. I could almost pick up the day before and put it on. And I was like, this isn't my message. Mm -hmm. Oh, like I'm not feeling great. I ended up getting like really severe knee pain. So much so that even me, like, I've, I've kind of gritted my teeth and gone through a lot of stuff. I pulled out on that 19th marathon, 20, 20 miles in. I literally could have walked to the end, but it was really, really sore. And I was walking around Leicester Square like, I'm, 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 called, I'm calling the challenge. Damn. It wasn't meant to be done at 18 marathons, 18 days. And I just thought, that's so funny because I was as like emotionally volatile as I'd ever been in that moment. I was really done. And I was just like... I, I wasn't living my truth at that point because I already realized oh, this isn't doing it for me. I've, I've done. And then suddenly the knee pain comes on. I never had any of it. And I was like, this is wild. Yeah. And then the next day I've announced I'm not doing the challenge anymore. I'm like, the knee pain's fine. It's unbelievable. Wow. Yeah. It is crazy how, how much stress I think correlates to those Massive. sort of things. Um, but I think as well, if we're looking at beginner runners and, and, myself in the beginning stages and how I think I've had the longevity to keep going without having because people always say like you know oh just you wait until you have a life-changing injury those 10 k's they're gonna come and get you but um I think I just haven't burnt myself out ever and I think that's really it's always felt really friendly running it's always felt like running is a space that I go to for myself for meditation for wellness it's not like a forcing thing it's never been like a punishment or a cruel thing that I'm doing to myself and I think there is some people that do have that kind of relationship with running yeah. um, and, and that can cause a lot of issues and injury and burnout yeah. and, and if we are a beginner runner and we're running a lot of our runs above five rpe rate of perceived exertion you shouldn't really be doing it mm. um really take the effort out of it when we run faster we are at more risk of getting injured that's the truth yeah and, and that's why running slow is is wonderful because running slow isn't just great because you build aerobic fitness it, it enables you to get more runs in because you have less risk of being injured um and anyone that's new to running i wouldn't just i wouldn't concern myself at least for the first six weeks with with any real pace work just no. like you mentioned comfy homey yeah. running yeah exactly so speaking of nutrition, um, this was uh, highly requested on the Q&A, is uh, basically just what do you eat before a run? <laughs> what do you know. eat, mate? Yeah, day before, night before, morning of a big run. Um, this, again, I'm going to say, obviously, Finn and I aren't nutritionists. Um, we're just little runners. Um, but, and again, this is so particular to different people, different people respond differently to different we we're just having a conversation outside about you know intra running nutrition and you love salt and vinegar crisps on a run yeah. i like dates or haribo but we've got to stop with the sweets got to have some proper proper food you have some sweets okay but there's got to be some actual dense foods so my my thing is i like if i know i've got a big run the next day i personally like to have a big old meal the night before because i don't like running feeling super heavy so I'll have like a big meal, something carby, and then, you know, bagel with some sugary jam and peanut butter before. Keep it super simple. And then I'll have Haribo on the run. But I will get better at having real food on a run. That's almost perfect. If yeah. you just if you just add a few more snacks to the run, then you've yeah. nailed it. <laughs> but I think if we break it down to, because you, you kind of, when we had our little intake call about Paris, you were saying 
Carbs before the run, and then always carbs. So, so, so essentially, obviously, it differs for every single person. During the run, if you can get around forty grams, up to sixty grams of uh, carbs per hour, then 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 great. That we're talking long runs here. Yeah, yeah. yeah. Anything ab- like above an above an hour. Yeah. Um, you can still practice snacking on shorter runs. So it doesn't mean that you, you know, you never take on food for a shorter run. Um, I actually really encourage a lot of people to, to practice on, even if you're just doing 7K at conversational pace, or even if you're doing just 30 minutes at, at conversational pace, you don't actually have to physically eat the food. Maybe just take a little nibble, but like just get into the, pro, like the habit of what does it feel like to carry the food with me, to, to have it, whether it is a gel, whether it is dates like you mentioned, or whether it is an energy bar, whatever you choose to eat. Get into the practice of of having that relationship with not just food, but also water. The water being the most important component mm-hmm. of any f- fueling strategy. Without yes. being hydrated, you are not going to digest the food that well. That's how you get stomach problems. Um, but in terms of the structure, you're absolutely right. I mean, if you go all the way back to if we're doing a race day and we're, we're tapering, it's within that taper that you really want to, which is, by the way, taper is around 12 to 14 days before race day where we drop the mileage. Again, kind of similar to a deload week. Uh, you can drop it by like 30, 30 percent, 40 percent, and you still keep the intensity. So you don't fear away from any interval sessions or yeah. tempo sessions. You still, you know, you attack the sessions, but the volume's dropped. In that period, maybe it's 10 to 12 days out. I think most studies say it's like 10 to 12 days where you can look to up your carbohydrates just a little bit, mm. um, whether it's by like 10%. Yeah, it doesn't need to be this whole carb load. You know, you see these like fucking crazy <laughs> plates of pasta with like croissants on oh, top right, of it. Yeah. And like, yeah, yeah, no, no, no. if anything, that's probably going to just make you feel a bit heavy. Um, so I think it's just, yeah, knowing that it is meant to be like 10%, oh, yeah, not yeah. 100. If you if, say you just got a classic dinner of sausages and mashed potato and veg, yeah. that mashed potato component literally just eke out a tiny bit of a mashed yeah. potato over a 10, 12 day period. That's yeah. a real effective way of yeah. carb loading, yeah. not just the night before scranning <laughs> loads of pasta. Gail's pastries yeah, yeah, for yeah. the rest of West uh, London. For sure. Um, yeah. And that's, that's, that's a nice way of doing a carb load. Um, but like you mentioned before, the night before, like just eat, if you actually, I don't know why he's in my head, but there's a guy called James Suarez I follow on Instagram. He's a, a friend of mine and I'm always interested about, with what he eats before a marathon. He's a quick marathon runner and he's just always out at like, um, a restaurant like eating just eating crap the night before because at that point the work should be done Yeah, yeah. Um, and just eating foods that you enjoy is really important and in, in the morning of again you still want your long acting carbohydrates in whatever form that, that comes in if it's the morning the chances are it could be something like a bagel with yeah. avocado or something sweet um, peanut butter and bananas um, and you might have a snack before which is a little bit sweeter again that's why you got your dates mm-hmm. and that's why you have sweets if you mm-hmm. go for that or your energy chews all that kind of stuff um mm-hmm. but don't hide away from the carbohydrates yeah wicked all right last question and i know that you're gonna love this one because <laughs> it's our favorite topic uh what are your favorite tried and true running shoes um obviously you know, we get asked this a lot because we are runners and we run in shoes. Um, but the blanket answer would be get your date tested. You get <laughs> your date, your dates got dates on them. Right? Get your gait tested. Everyone needs different shoes. Everyone has different feet. Everyone is training for different things on different terrain. So we all need completely different shoes. My favorites are Sacconi's. I love Sacconi. I've recently found them through Nick Bear, actually. Uh, and they're working really well for me and they don't have a carbon plate because I was running in carbon plates every single day, which, why is that bad? Just because it's... Because a carbon plate is uh, essentially, it's a sole of a shoe which helps you run faster, it springs you forward. It's a very responsive shoe and and you're not, apart from your far sessions and your, your races, you probably want to be staying out of those because it's just firing you up when you just want to be chilled. Yeah probably overworking muscles for a longer period of time if you're using them for every session. So um, you take the carbon plate out and you just run on and maybe more standard running shoes like you're doing. It's a little bit easier for the body. And it'll give you that boost on race day, right? Yeah. Because you'll be like, whoa, here we go. Oh, absolutely. Yeah, yeah. yeah. Um, I, if I gave a favorite, I would say New Balance. It's actually funny because I'm wearing New Balance. (laughs) Wrapping. (laughs) <laughs> New, New Balance fresh foams for me. They, yeah, they're good. They were the heartbeats of so many of my running challenges. They are and good. 
I I love them so much. Mm. Yeah. I think yeah, those are good. I tried the London Marathon ones actually. Um, New Balance are great. Nike, you know, they do those big spaceship shoes, which <laughs> they're good fun. I think for race day, you know. Yeah, um, definitely. But for an everyday, uh, I think can't beat the Adidas and Saucony. Nice. In my opinion. I would say though, when it comes to getting tested for your gait, just be careful because sometimes you can go into a store that's it's just like a a shop and right. they say they test your gait, but it's they, just all it's there's no like professional there. So be careful with who you choose and. Um, know that if you go into a store and there isn't a professional person that mm. that works with gate analysis, that it's probably just a marketing ploy mm. um, to upsell. So, right. and you can't beat feel, for example, which is why I, again, you know, I, I beat around the bush with this answer with what's the best shoe because the um, there's a, a German word that apparently is Spielzeug, which basically means that kind of thing that you feel that you can't explain. So something that feels nice, it's pleasure, but you, you can't really explain why it is. And apparently I did hear that that isn't actually true, but we're going with it. <laughs> so Let's roll with it. Yeah, we'll roll with it. And, <laughs> and that's the best thing to find with a shoe. Yeah, just something that feels everything. good. I think what I like about a shoe is when it feels like I'm not wearing shoes. <laughs> Light? <laughs> yeah, but because I, 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 I've got very dense ankles. I get them from my dad. We've got like dense calves and ankles so very strong so I've got friends who I run with who are a wee bit taller than me and whose ankles just look quite fragile sometimes they're running and I'm like oh yeah you need a lot of ankle support whereas I think I'm quite a yeah I'm quite sturdy so I, I do prefer a shoe that feels a little less supportive but nice. some people would love a shoe that feels very supportive um so that's our spiel on shoes and with that that's all the questions we've been yammering away for over an hour so I'll uh flown by yeah an hour yeah but uh, I know, crazy, right? Thank you so much for for coming on and doing this again. Um, I think I didn't ask you at the beginning, but how are you? <laughs> just... I'm just so gutted you didn't ask me how I was. <laughs> I'm fuming. I've spent the last hour <laughs> being not happy. No, I'm I'm really really good. Um, yeah, I mean, <laughs> I'm excited to do this podcast. Yeah. Um, and yeah, no, I, I'm just very fortunate. Feel very grateful to be alive, and that is the the default response and hopefully we can all have that at some point because it's a great feeling it is i feel the same i think i'm in a yeah i'm in a space where i'm just sort of seeing every day as a little adventure um and a kind of being more detached from life at the moment if that makes any sense wow i got all hippie what, what in drugs, what drugs you yeah. on? <laughs> it's called buddhism <laughs> oh, nice yeah, <laughs> yeah. yeah um damn yeah you should have seen that doisy tap run the one up to the temple yeah, that i did epic. 13k of like elevation but again, not that I'm going to say it was easy, but certainly it wasn't hellish. Do you know, it was like, it was fine. And you were that's lo locked in. Mental. The fact that I could do that, move my body through that was, was mental. And that, may, that made me feel quite confident for Paris. Because I was like, oh, that was really tough. But I did it. And Paris is flat, right? Isn't it? Yeah, pretty oh, much. Pretty flat. There, I think there are a couple, couple little bits of incline, but yeah. it's like, it's a city. Yeah. It won't be too bad. But... Yeah. Yeah, it's unbelievable. I saw it. It looks it looks unreal. Practicing for the cobblestones in Paris. Yeah. I, I once got I wasn't in Paris, but I did a marathon in Rome once and uh I got hit off I got hit by a moped oh, person. Shit. And I, whenever I think of cobbles, I just think of like I properly got cut up. But I remember just looking down and seeing all my blood on the cobbles. So that's during Rome Marathon. No, it was just me doing a marathon. It, it was just you. Okay, I forget. Yeah, yeah you are just out. Of but um, it was on mile four. I remember thinking like, really? Thought, but yeah, so the cobbles. I have a bit of flashbacks to that. PTSD. Now. I end up in a like not in a bin, but like by a bin on the floor. Yeah. Oh my god. Well, yeah. we'll have to do exposure therapy when we get to Paris. Thanks. We have to be like Finn. This is a cobblestone. You're gonna be fine. <laughs> gonna be, yeah. Yeah. Uh, Eat it. Um, but no, it'll be nice. I think it's a good crew of us going. So I think it'll be a really lovely trip. Three medals. Uh, me, Rihanna. Um, Soph won't run it, obviously. <laughs> Can you <imagine>? Absolutely. <laughs> I, I, however, she said that she will do one before she turns 30, and that's in September. So she hasn't got long. A uh, marathon? Yeah. Okay, that's going to be hilarious. Yeah. I'll definitely be there for that. Yeah, oh, happen. the other thing I wanted to ask you, um, that's, we've gone all very casual, but it's fine. Um, the Thames Ultra Challenge. Will you do 100 with me? Yeah, this year? Yeah. Yeah, of course. May? 
do it double. So as always, guys, thank you so much for joining us. We're going to end on a poem that the lovely Finley has okay. written down. I wrote it down. Handwritten. How gorgeous <laughs> is that? Um, so we'll end with it. that. And uh, yeah, take it away. Yeah, so this poem, actually, I, I know the first four lines off by heart, but there's a load more to it that I don't know. So I've written it down. But it's it's by Ziggy Alberts, who's one of my favorite artists. If you don't know Ziggy Alberts, check him out. But he's a he's an old soul as well. And it goes like this. When you set out in pursuit of your dreams, know that you become responsible, not just for the dreams of yourself, but also for the dreams of others. Because we all have dreams and some people never set foot in their direction. And so you adopt the responsibility of the dreamer. And by pursuing yours, you light a torch and remember this when you feel a heavy burden. Of course it's heavy when so few people are carrying out their dreams. But someone may stop and see your light, feel the warmth and take to the Kindle. And suddenly they're flammable. And your role in this, my friend, is of utmost importance because people are rarely encouraged in any way, shape or form to pursue a life worth dreaming for. Yet it is the pursuit of our dreams and the previously unimagined that keeps both hope and the human spirit alight. Beautiful. Yes. Wonderful. You have to send me that one. It's That's cool. a good one. It's I, a very good yeah, one. it resonated with me so much, especially when I started doing all this running stuff, because when, you know, when I looked around, I didn't feel like there was much, not there wasn't much support. Everyone was so nice, but there wasn't many people, there weren't many people riding the same way, the wave of just wanting something else out of life. And yeah. I think that when I started to do it, I'd go home to where I lived and people would be like, oh, I saw what you did, man. And because of that, I, I, I lost four stone. I'm like, Dude, it's a ripple. Ripple. Effect. It really is a ripple. And I think about this so much. I do think about like how maybe someone did a 5K and then their kids saw them and yeah. then that made them more active or they went to school and then they did that and then through generations and around the world and it's you've just got to keep doing the positive thing. Yeah. And, and it's a, and it, like he says, it's, it does feel like a heavy burden sometimes. And that's, I mean, I can't imagine what it's like for you, but it's I have genuinely like cried at the thought of like these people that they what they say they've done off the back of something that you share. And I think... You have yeah. to keep going, man. I'm in tears, like, I'm because I'm such a sensitive person and, like, I do quite well at hiding it, but I am very sensitive. Maybe I don't hide it at all. I'm incredibly cringe online. But, um, yeah, like, I, you know, you get DMs just saying, you know, because of you, I opened the front door, I went for a run, or because of you, I set a boundary, because of you, I went to the gym, because of you, I <clears throat> looked at my relationship with alcohol, looked at my relationship with my boyfriend, whatever, and it's just, like... I, I can't, I sometimes have to just detach myself from it because I will just be sobbing 24 no, hours a day. I imagine, I... <laughs> and, and I mean, I, I'm not you, I'm not Jordan Peterson, but Jordan Peterson <laughs> talks about this. And I mean, he gets super emotional. But he says that he'll just walk down the street and someone will be like, like just stuff that you've mentioned. And it's like, that is unbelievable. And it's insane that one person can make that kind of change in someone else. But actually, it's really sad that, that's the, where we're at. You the know? lack of encouragement. And that's another conversation for another time. But it is incredible. I think, yeah, and... people need so little encouragement to feel like. And I think this is what this podcast has struck on is that because in my mind, this is quite a boring. It is quite boring. No, because it is just <laughs> me and it is just my thoughts of the week oh, for an no. hour. But I think it's just a gentle encouragement that people lack so much in their personal lives. And we're looking so much for external, you know, sort of places to get that kind of like gentle push towards, hey, kid, actually, you can do this. And um, uh, for sure. well, I'm very I'm very pleased to be that person. and You are that person, too. Well, obviously, I do, I do a lot of work with uh, the runners at 444 Coaching, uh, which obviously Cassia heads up and obviously so many of them. Uh, if ever I say anything to them, uh, the answers they give back would be in relation to the, po the podcast. And it, people, uh, yeah, it's so cool they tune in. And, and most importantly, like, you know, bring themselves and listen. Yes. Because I know, you know, whenever I go on podcasts, there are a select few that listen, but, you know, that's not the case for most people. They, mm -hmm. they don't tune in. And it's, it's cool that you, you have that community. It's Yeah, it's wonderful. I think people giving themselves that space every single week, whether it's on a walk or a run or cleaning or, you know, they're productive while they listen. And yeah, it feels like I've got a big bunch of friends. So, and they love you. So thank you for coming on, Finn. I'm sure thank we'll, you so much we should try and me. do Pleasure. this, you know, once a season, have the Finn, Finn episode. <laughs> I mean, I love it. I love just chatting. Yeah. 
Yeah, I know. I could do this for three hours, honestly. But um, yeah. All right. Well, thank you guys for listening. Thank you, Finn. Until next time, peace and love, blessings, all that good stuff. And I'll catch you next week. 